Just think what a witness would be the teaching of salvation to all the various Protestants, brethren, and all these various churches of this world are going to learn, and they're going to have this now witness, and our people are going to be learning about this topic that belongs also to the, as I said, true Bible theology. Salvation. So salvation, how God will rescue men. Huh. Isn't that the crucial question? Yes. Isn't that the crucial teaching of the Bible? Yes. Does the world understand it? No, of course not. Of course not. Well, let's picture now that there is a wind-whipped lake waters. And just think there is a small boat. And just think there is a little boy, a little boy in a boat who, 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 who cries out, save me. Because wind with lake waters had just capsized his small sailboat and he was in peril of drowning. Just like we're in peril of drowning of all of our sins and so on. And the boy was saved by the skills of a quick-thinking lifeguard. Yes, brethren, this little boy knew that he needed saving, but today a lot of adults are not quite sure about whether they need to be saved, at least not spiritually. They don't even know what salvation is, let alone whether they need it. Therefore, they stand in potential peril far more terrifying than the little boy above did. They stand in peril of not obtaining eternal life. And this must not happen to you. You must understand the Bible doctrine of salvation. So what is the basic doctrine of the Bible when it comes to salvation? Well, salvation is God's rescue of man from eternal death, which man has earned by sin to the safety of eternal life at Jesus Christ's return. Salvation is a process, a process made possible by the life and death of Jesus Christ. Of course, the usual teachings of this world are all totally contrary to the Bible. Often it's taught that salvation is a saving of man from ever-burning hell, fire to eternal bliss as an angel in heaven. Others believe that our salvation is totally, absolutely and completely guaranteed at baptism. And the once baptized, you are forever saved. Or as it may be stated, once saved, always saved. Still others don't even quite, they don't even require baptism. But they also, but they teach, other than not requiring baptism, they also teach that if a believer will just give his heart to the Lord or call upon or profess Christ's name, he will be saved. Some equate being saved with being born again. But brethren, what is the truth? What does the Bible say? Isn't that what we are supposed to know? Yes, we are. And here it is. To begin, even a simple dictionary definition of the word salvation reveals that to save someone means to rescue him from some sort of evil or undesired fate. But in the case of our Christian calling, we must ask, what is it that we are saved from and why? Further, we must find out how we are saved and when and by whom. It doesn't take much thought to see that man's greatest enemy is indeed death. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now Paul adds to that in 1 Corinthians 15, in the chapter on resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26, The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And why do we die? Well, the Bible records simply the death, they, the death that is the second death, death with no hope of life again, is the penalty for sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The Bible further states that into the world came, in Romans 5.12, death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, and have come short, fallen short of the glory of God. Thus we need to be saved from death because of sin. Just like the little boy needed to be saved from death because of drowning. If you go to Romans 7.13, we need to be saved from sin. Let's go to Romans first, Romans 7.13. And then we'll go to James 1.15. So it's Romans 7, verse 13. He then, sorry, has then, what is good become, become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, 
was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So you see, you see, we keep the commandment, but nevertheless sin just then enrages and wants to take dominance, and the old man never wants to die, and so therefore, you know, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. James, chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse uh, 15. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And this truth, brethren, that death is the penalty of sin, will shock those who have been falsely taught that the wages of sin is eternal life in a forever burning hell fire. Such teachings is, are untrue. No, there is no hell. There is no hell burning fire. There is the lake of fire that will destroy all the rebellion against God. And that's about as much as we have of the fire. And of course, the reward of the saved is not to be in eternal bliss in heaven, filling the harps or doing whatever, and praising their Lord all day and night. Oh no, the reward of the, of the, of the saved will be much more exciting if you wish. But that's another topic. So, if salvation means being saved from death, to what are we saved? Romans 6.23 supplies more of the answer when it says, Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hence, we are saved logically from death to life, to eternal life. Yet, other scriptures go on to show that this eternal life is not eternal physical life, but spiritual life. If you notice Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the famous resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and if you notice, please, uh, especially verses 12 and beyond. Verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. <laughs> yes, indeed. The Gentiles will be grafted into Israel, and thus we as hope of Israel will by Church of God continue to spread this hope all over the world, and it's getting ever more exciting because our good quality literature is already producing incredible incredible results, incredible interests, and incredible thirst for the knowledge of God. Um, and again, Isaiah says, yes, we read Isaiah, verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, that's what we're working on, to be filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points, as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. And then he continues, he continues all the way up to verse 58, uh, to verse, uh, uh, is it 50? No, uh, all the way, all the way up to, uh, sorry, I'm in Romans. Why am I in Romans instead of being in 1 Corinthians? I was thinking about, yeah, I was thinking, doesn't, doesn't chapter 50 has about 58 verses? <laughs> it does, brethren, but I'm in the wrong book. I'm in the wrong book. I was in Romans. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 now, verse 12. I said, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, that was one of the heresies that obviously crept into the early church as part of Gnosticism, brethren. And Gnostic religion is the first uh, uh, original ideology and theology that subverted the original church and on my channel bible history or biblical history you have uh, now a, uh, a playlist gnosticism i think at least in serbian with all the basic teachings on gnosticism but also you have a playlist which uh, embodies uh, simon magus who was the first gnostic in the new testament 
and he was the founder of the what today is the leading Gnostic <laughs> church in the world, seated right there in Rome. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yeah, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable, says, and then he goes on all the way to verse 58. And the whole point is of the last part of, of chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians is to show that saved man is composed of spirit and not flesh. And he, he has eternal life. So, brethren, that's the answer. We are saved from what to what? Uh, we are saved from sin, which produces death, because the wages of sin is death, and we are saved to eternal life, so that we can, you know, we can enjoy life forever. And of course, it won't be a dull life that we'll be fiddling the, fiddling the, 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 the harps and whatever in heaven. It's going to be a life full of dynamic, of, of joy, of creation. God is creator. Our Father is creator, and we're supposed to become part of the God family. So that is what it is. So we are logically saved to eternal life. So in that light, Paul speaking of the change that one who is saved goes through from flesh to spirit in verse 44 of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, states that one starts out with a physical body, but at the resurrection is raised to a, is raised a spiritual body. Other verses in the Bible show that our level of existence will not merely be that of angels, but that our bodies will be transformed so they conform to, I'm quoting Philippians 3.21, Philippians 3.21, they'll conform to his, Christ's, glorious body, and that we will be made members of God's family. Now why should that be shocking? This is shocking to the world because the world thinks that God is a trinity, closed trinity, and that, you know, that's about it. Well, if you go to 1 Corinthians about the fact that we'll become spirit beings, that will be spirit composed, composed people in glorified the same body as Christ had, first uh, John chapter three and the verse one Behold what men of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for he shall, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, yes, this hope in the God of Israel, this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So uh, we'll be members of God's own family. That's the pivotal and the foundational truth that all the members of the Church of God need to understand. Not only those who are baptized, but also those who are not baptized because they will be born into the family of God is the pivotal New Testament truth, brethren. So that's, that's understanding that needs to finally sink into our minds and something we should be aware of all the time. We will be members of God's own family. We'll be gods themselves. Of course, we will not be just like, you know, the father Father has children. His children can never be as old as he is and all that stuff. You know, and people come up with their reasoning. Yes, of course, we cannot be like God in that sense because he's eternal and, 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 and he has existed forever. But yes, we'll be born into that family. We'll inherit eternal life and we're going to be, you know, forever creators. We're going to be forever living in eternal life. We, I don't really know how it will look like, but I can just envision us. Envision us making all kinds of stuff. And it says in Romans that the whole creation is waiting for the appearance of the children of God, meaning for the children of God to be born into God's family, so that then creation will finally be able to be released from decay and death. Well, that's fine. Which means if we have eternal life, we're going to be we're going to be giving life. 
Now, why should all of that, brethren, be, be, be surprised to anyone? When you, when you connect all the dots in the Bible, how did it start in the Garden of Eden? It was a tree of life. The tree of life, or the tree of eternal life, was the right choice that men, first man and first woman, did not make. They instead chose the other tree, which represented Satan and his way. And what is Satan here for? Well, as it says in, in, in one verse in Roman, in, in, in John, I think, in the Gospel of John, Satan is here to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's what's happening to all of creation. All of this huge universe, which is dead. Dead planets, dead moon, dead. You know, there is death everywhere, decay and death. And what was the solution? The solution is that the uh, children of God be born into the family of God. And then decay and death is going to leave this whole creation, it says. And that's, the, I guess, the one of the most basic revelations of the New Testament that even those of you who consider baptism should understand. That we are to be born into God's family, and we're going to be full-fledged members of that family, just like Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the first human who rose from the dead, and he was born again. He got glorious body. We're going to have the same, the same, exactly the same, the same, the same, the same destiny because we're here, we're co uh, co heirs. We are going to inherit. He's the first among many brethren. So he's the first glorified God being now among you know many brethren who are going to follow later. And when we connect all those dots of the Bible, the revelation is just so shocking to this world and yet so glorious and exceeds all of those silly human man-made doctrines that are not even close <laughs> to such a glory and to such a genius plan of salvation that God has for humankind. But understand this, brethren, please understand this. Nowhere does the Bible promise heaven as salvation. Instead, it says, no man has ascended to heaven except Jesus Christ in John 3.13. That's what Christ said to, uh, uh, to one of his visitors at night. And especially, you know, nobody ascended to heaven. And especially that includes even righteous David among those who are not in heaven. Because in Acts 3.2, sorry, Acts 2.34, as he preached his first inspired doctrine on the day of Pentecost, the first New Testament day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter said that not even that even the uh, grave, the tomb of righteous David is still among them, among the Jews of that time, and the tomb of David is still, as we know, does exist in the Promised Land, and uh, it's still among us. David did not ascend to heaven. That's what Jesus said. And yet, you know what all these people believe? All these various churches, you know, they have ascension. You've got the churches in the normal Christianity of Orthodoxy and Catholicism. The, 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 the churches are dedicated to the ascension of Holy Virgin Mary to heaven and all of that stuff. But if nobody went to heaven, nobody is going to go to heaven. Heaven is not the reward of the saints. Of the saints, And I know that I'm, I, I said it for you, but I think perhaps thousands of people may hear it. Because we have been preaching through social networks, we've been doing and spreading the, the good news, and thousands of people never heard the fact that they will not go to heaven. They never heard John 3.13, when Jesus Christ clearly, clearly said that nobody ascended to heaven, and nobody will. Just the one who descended from heaven, that was only him, went up later to heaven to regain the glory that he lost when he deposed himself of his glorious body, to become a human being. And why did he do that, brethren? Well, there are two reasons I want you to keep in mind. Reason one, yes, to die for our sins, because only the death of a God, only the death of God himself, I said a God because we know there are two beings, God beings, God the Father now, and Jesus Christ the Son. Only the death of God was able to pay the sum total penalty for all the sins of humanity, number one. But there is another reason why he had to come. Remember Matthew chapter 4, 
Remember that Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil. Brethren, he had to qualify to replace Satan over the throne of the earth. And many people don't don't get it or they just they, they just uh, uh, oversee that. Please keep that in mind because that also shows us the Day of Atonement that we keep. Brethren, the world, there are thousands of people keeping the Day of Atonement, but many of them have no clue why do they keep it. They have no clue what it means. When Christ, when he comes, he's going to bound Satan for a thousand years and of course he's going to become king and rule with his saints as we see described in Revelation 20. But people don't get it. Even in the Church of God, I'm not sure how many how many people understand, because only the Church of God understands this, how many people understand that Christ is coming to rule the earth. And before he had to before he would come to rule the earth, he had to qualify first. He conquered Satan, resisted all the all the temptations of the Satan, and that's why he qualified. That was another reason why he had to come to the earth. But many people don't seem to get it. Rather, we have to get it. We have to be educated well. We have to have a clear, 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 clear picture. As I said last Sabbath, we cannot be a bunch of dummies. Oh, going to keep the Sabbath. Oh, let's go and gather on the Sabbath because, oh yes, Sabbath is a beautiful day. Uh, it's, it's God's sacred time. And let's just get together because it's nice to be a lovely, lovely social club. No, brethren. That's wrong. That will be just right, terrible Odyssean attitude, I think. We get together because the Church of God is the school for eternal life. So we get together to get educated, and I'm and again, I'm placing so much emphasis on education, better because we, for some reason, did not place that uh, we did not place that emphasis in the past as much as we should have. Oh, it was lovely to know we have, I don't know, members in, in Tanzania and members in, in Slovenia. And, uh, oh, well, we are preaching now the gospel here, there, and everywhere. Well, that's fine. That's all fine. But what is the, oh, and we have people in, I don't know, people in Estonia getting together. And we have a congregation in Mozambique and this, that, and the other. And that's all fine. But what's the purpose of that? And what's the use of all of that if we have, if we are just a bunch of dummies getting together, not really understanding why. Only because we love the Sabbath, we love God, and uh, sure. But we're talking about salvation now. It's an important topic, brethren. We need to understand what it is. I just explained to you, we are saved from what to what. And no, we're not going to be in heaven. We're going to be part of God's family, another foundational doctrine. I'm not sure how many our baptism candidates in the past understood it, but now it has to be understood. We're not a bunch of dummies that come together just because we love one another. Yes, we love one another, that's for sure. But we come together also because we realize that we are coming together out of love for God and we have we need to have this thirst for being educated in God's Word because we're going to be the teachers in the world tomorrow. And I'm just, uh, you know, I was just appalled by the level of, 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 of ignorance When level of ignorance that certain people who have been keeping the Sabbath for years here in with me have 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 uh, shown level of their ignorance, I was I was shocked. I was shocked when I was again when I was in Africa to see yes people kind of come together and they think if they keep the Sabbath oh there's a so special no brethren Christian life is much more than keeping the Sabbath. It's much more because it, it encompasses the character, the change of thought process, the change of our hearts, the change of our minds. Conquering the deadly human nature, conquering the world around us and conquering its ruler, the arch enemy of the church, Satan the devil. So once again, nowhere, that's why I said, because you understand that we will not go to heaven, but there will be others who have not heard that ever. So once again, nowhere does the Bible promise heaven as salvation. Nowhere. But how does God save men? Because the wages of sin is death, 
and therefore for God to save man requires that he remove this penalty by forgiving sin and further that he replace man's nature with a new nature that will not sin. <laughs> now there are numerous verses that prove beyond all doubt that the forgiveness of sin is possible because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I'm sure you all know that, you understand that. Virtually every Christian denomination, I would think, would agree with that statement. But in Acts 2, uh, 23, it states that all, because all are sinners, must repent and be baptized in an outward show of the acceptance of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. In Acts 2, 21, and Romans 10, 13, it's very clear that salvation requires one to believe in the sacrifice of Christ and all it entails. Now, I mentioned to you many times, our repentance is toward God because our sins are against God. Our faith is towards Christ because we accept in faith his sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. As the result, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now I mentioned Romans 10, 13. Why don't we just read Romans 10, 13? And the other one that you can put together will be Acts 2, 21. But Romans 10, 13, let's just add to the picture. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 5.10, we have the statement, very plain statement, that we are justified for, from our sins through the, sacrifice at, uh, through the sacrifice of Christ, and then we are saved by his life, you see. Because his sacrifice pays the penalty for our death, but we are not alive because of his sacrifice, brethren. That's another thing that we need to understand. Because of his eternal life now, because he rose back from the dead, he rose back to life, his life is what really saves us. Romans 5.10 mentions that very clear, but uh, I'm afraid this has escaped many attention of many of Christians. Uh, Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. As clear as it could be. But how many of us have really understood this clear picture, these clear verses, these clear statements in the past? How many of us? I don't really know. But what I want to know is that those, those of us here now do you understand this fully well and that our baptism candidates would understand it before they come uh, uh, to the point of baptism? Because, brethren, the ignorance is absolutely amazing. The ignorance is one of Satan's best tools of manipulation and, 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 and uh, deception. And I'm coming to realize how much this ignorance is important. And that's, that's why I said to you, I want to turn the whole church into an educational institution if you wish all the church we don't have we don't need to have well it would be nice if we had in the college or stuff it would be nice but we we don't have money for that we don't have means for that and we don't have even need for that because now we have this we have this internet we can reach the whole world and we can make the whole church an educational system that's what it should be the church is a school friends it's not a social club it's not a place so oh, nice to come and see people on the sabbath yes it's part of that, but it's only it's very irrelevant part of that. We come together because we are to be taught and educated for the kingdom of God. We're taught, we're trained to become kings and priests. And yes, Christian fellowship, uh, especially when it is imbued with this kind of cooperation and love that we have been showing to one another, is part of all that. Yes, indeed. It makes us very happy, satisfied. Uh, it gives us the feeling of being blessed and being guided by God of Israel, it gives us the sense of, of, of what Christ said that Philadelphia will be what Philadelphia will be like. And it also formed us into, if, if you wish, a Philadelphian government style, which obviously <laughs> some or many don't really understand what it is. But we've understood it now over this over this several weeks of our cooperation. When we all just chipped in with whatever we understand, with all of our uh, with all of our experiences, with all of our understanding, with all of our good suggestions, and we all just all pulled up together to come up in various languages and dialects with very good quality, basic literature of the church doctrines, and it all started with the statements of belief. 
so we have in our experience we have felt that it's like hands-on experience you know you have that expression in english well it's like hands-on experience we have all experienced the benefits of the true philadelphian government style because that style is characterized by love uncompromising love for god and god's truth and of course the brotherly love for the brethren so from all that we have covered so far Let's add Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, which tells us that salvation is not something we earn, but it's a gift of grace from God through faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So yes, our faith is the gift of God, but we keep the law of God at the same time, not because we want to be saved or earn salvation, as all these Protestants and others wrongly believe. We keep the, the, uh, the commandments of God because out of love for God, because there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law that is characterized by love, eternal love, perfect love of God. And that law, if you wish, brethren, builds also our character. And without good, righteous, perfect character, we cannot really enter into the kingdom of God. So from all these things, it should be obvious that our salvation is accomplished finally only at the resurrection when our mortal bodies are changed into immortal bodies when eternal life, uh, with eternal life as God's sons and daughters. Yet many in traditional Christianity persist in the notion that once a person is baptized, or once a person has at least accepted, accepted another quotation mark, accepted Christ verbally or called upon the name of the Lord that he is now saved, because they, they, they rely on what we have just read in Romans 10, 13. Well, clearly this is not the teaching of the Bible, brother. None of us is yet finally saved or lost. Because Jesus Christ says clearly in the Gospels that only those who endure to the end will be saved. So salvation is a future event. Will be saved at his return, of course. Now, numerous verses prove that one can be disqualified from eternal life even after baptism or even after professing Christ. Because Christ plainly taught that only, Matthew 10, 22, he who endures to the end will be saved, Matthew 10, 22. Therefore, salvation is, as I said, in the future after the end of a person's life and requires enduring during this life paul himself confirmed that it was possible even for him to lose out on salvation saying he fought to keep himself under spiritual subjection to christ lest as he says in this first corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 lest when i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified so certainly Paul did not teach that we are saved now, nor did he teach that we cannot lose out on salvation no matter what we do. And thus so-called once saved, always saved teaching evaporates. Those who believe such misconceptions usually do so based on an incorrect understanding of some Bible verses. For example, for instance, they go to Acts 1 uh, or Acts 2.21 and Romans or Romans 10.13 which both state whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They also go to John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. Let's read that one. How people misunderstand, sadly, the Bible. Uh, John uh, 1, verse 12 says, uh, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So, you know, nominal Christians at large take these verses to mean that all of us or or that all that one all of us that means all of the people and all of the believers that all that all that you know all that one and all of us must do is make some sort of verbal profession or acceptance of Christ either publicly or in a tent meeting <laughs> in the past or perhaps privately to oneself or in their churches to have fulfilled all the requirements of Christianity for all time but the Bible, brethren, shows that it means to call upon the Lord. What it means to call upon the Lord? That it takes knowledge, knowledge again, understanding, obedience, overcoming, faith, and enduring. That's what it is to call 
upon the Lord. And not just, oh, we just merely profess him verbally once, and yeah, he's now in our heart. And all we need to do to be saved, we'll just call upon the Lord. And every time this topic comes up, you know, you always have people say, well, 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 salvation is so universal already because all that one should do is just call upon the name of the Lord. Well, not so. Not so because Christian life, as we know, is, in, is a calling from God. And nobody can come to Christ unless God the Father draws him to the very Christ Jesus. So even as the saving of a drowning victim has certain stages, such as the throwing of the life, life vest, um, the victims reaching for it, he's being towed in and finally he's reaching dry land. So also is salvation a process which begins with, of course, repentance, which follows by baptism and forgiveness of sins, continuing through a life of overcoming and culminating at the resurrection when Jesus Christ returns. But it is only then, at the resurrection, that we can say we are truly saved in the final sense. So to be fair, however, we must also look finally to a couple of more scriptures, which both state that God has saved us, and in light of what we have already proven, it is clear what Paul means. The first scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy. Chapter 1 and verse 9, which says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, calling again, Christianity is a calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So that's number one. So he has saved us. And Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, verse 4 says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, you see, we have done it. We are doing the works of righteousness because out of love for God, because faith without works is dead. So one way or the other, all of these misconceptions that Christianity abounds with are, are, are totally disproved by what the Bible clearly says. So not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of, or, of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Alludes, this is allusion to baptism as well. Well, both of these scriptures state that God has saved us. But in light of what we have already proven, it's clear, it's clear what Paul means. Those on the road to salvation, brethren, are in a special category. They are the saved as opposed to the lost. Paul phrased these statements this way, not because our salvation is now complete, totally assured or perfected. For remember, Paul himself, we just read, stated that even he could fall away and lose out. No, but he just said, you know, that uh, 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 phrased uh, these statements the way, because our salvation is sure if we continue faithfully in the category God has called us to. So that's basically about salvation. The key verses that you may jot down if you haven't, and I always encourage you to keep notes because this is a school. And like in every school, all the students are always encouraged. All the disciples are encouraged to take notes. So I encourage you to take notes, even though we'll have all these materials written as a handbook for all the church members and for all the interested parties in the world because, again, we are the educational institution, brethren. So other than when we put on the social networks, you know, Hope of Israel, the Worldwide Church of God, we usually put religious religious organization in, in our description or we put the um, Christian church in our description or we can write, <laughs> totally rightly, we can add educational institution. Because that's what we are. We are here to educate people for the world tomorrow, to educate people about the true Bible theology, to educate people into the principles that lead us to eternal life. So here are some verses to remember about this important subject. Romans 6.23 We are doomed to die because of sin, 
but we can have eternal life if saved. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12 all the way up to verse 58. Eternal life comes through a change from a mortal body to a spiritual immortal body at the resurrection. The first resurrection, which is the better resurrection, as it says in Revelation. And uh, those who become part of the first resurrection, they are going to be co-rulers with Jesus Christ. They are going to reign over the earth for 1,000 years. Remember uh, Revelation 20. And once Satan is bound, once he is replaced on the throne by Jesus Christ, then the saints are going to take over the rulership. Uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 24, says about the same. That the saints will rule and have the dominion and power. And that's why we're being taught now and today, brethren. That's why it is important that we have focus on proper biblical education and that our minds are crystal clear from all of these various misconceptions that baffle, that baffle and, 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 and confuse the world. The author of confusion is not God the Father. The author of confusion, I'm sure you all know who it is. Among other key verses is Acts 2.21 and Acts 2.38 and Romans 10.13. Because they show that to be saved we must profess Christ. Yes, indeed. Matthew 10, 22, to be saved we must endure. And 1 Corinthians 9, 27, we can lose out on salvation after baptism. If we are not faithful and we are not faithfully persistent, and we, if we are not enduring to the end, yes, we can lose out after baptism. And that's probably one thing that everybody should know, because we usually thought once we get baptized, all of our problems will be solved and all our problems will evaporate and uh, you know we will be almost one foot into the kingdom of god oh no no we are closer to the kingdom of god it's we are on the way to the kingdom of god but we have to endure we have to remain faithful regardless what the cost and it's easier said than done you wouldn't believe what kind of challenges people have to give up certain things that are totally wrong you wouldn't believe, for example, just to give you an, il an illustration from my society, just to, just to illustrate, you probably have, well, the Sabbath being the, the, the key issue in your societies, most likely, uh, in every society. So we have the booklet on the Sabbath with all the reasonings that Christians put up when it comes to Sabbath keeping. But there is, for example, one challenge here to give up pork. I'm not sure if that's the case in your societies, but one of the greatest challenges of the people here in my country is to give up pork. Pork? Yeah, no. Well, how can we live without pork? Pork can be everywhere. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, all the food is, is nice and, 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 and tasty. But, you know, a little pork is what we need. Uh, cooking on lard and all that stuff. You wouldn't believe what a challenge it is for people to overcome that, brethren. That seems so trivial to me. I guess because for decades now I haven't been eating pork and... Uh, and I think for a long time, I, 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 even the smell of the pork now just makes me sick. But you wouldn't believe what a huge challenge for people it is, at least in this country. A thing to overcome. So in conclusion, whether we are a drowning boy or a man or a woman full of years, we all know that we are, apart from God's salvation, doomed to death. But the good news, the good news that we are preaching around the world is that our God stands ready to rescue those he calls who come to him in obedience and for forgiveness with a cry of save me.